welcome uh, for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Elmer Weber, I'm the CTO at Copenia, we're a startup in the space here. Uh, give you a quick introduction in case you don't know, this whole building um, is uh, Rockstar Spaces, which is a startup space in Amsterdam. Um, and we, yeah, uh, when it's possible, we're trying to host events like this because uh, we, we like to share our knowledge with the community. And of course also because um, it's a uh, good location, the Amsterdam City Center. So um, in case you um, yourselves are hosting meetups or need something, just uh, contact us afterwards as well. It's easy for us to, um, uh, to arrange something like today. And um, I also today want to talk a bit uh, to you about what is, um, my company, Copenia, um, did with Kubernetes. Uh, it's going to be basically the stories that we had over the last um, year, uh, what we did uh, to move from our normal environment and to applying Docker and Kubernetes step by step and the journey we took, um, our lessons learned and um, what we did along the way. Uh, if you have any questions or something is not clear, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer the question. If it takes a bit longer, I might move it to the end because we're a bit on a timeline because we have multiple talks today. And uh, yeah, let's just get, uh, get started. Um, so this is basically what I want to uh, walk you through today. I want to show you a bit why we actually started with uh, Docker and Kubernetes, what the original idea was, uh, the first steps and tries that we undertook, why, um, how we used it to kind of manage our development process and testing individual feature and bug fixes in their own environments. Uh, how this led to in the next step for us actually to containerizing our whole build infrastructure. And then finally how we rolled Kubernetes out into our production environment and processing all our workloads uh, on top of this. I'm um, going to do a quick outro on like, how do we monitor and how we're growing Kubernetes now um, to like a large scale deployment. And as a summary, kind of like lessons learned, so how, kind of like what can you take away uh, if you don't do anything else from this talk, just remember when you start with Kubernetes what you should, uh, should consider. Um, quick introduction, um, I already told you, so I'm Anna Weber, I'm CTO at Compania. Um, why should you listen to me? So basically, I have been developing software and deploying software since around 10 years. Although, deploying software was always kind of the thing that I ended up with doing. I didn't, never really wanted to do it, because uh, I'm a hard I'm a developer, I do machine learning, I do big data. But I don't want to be bothered with deployment. But uh, no matter for which kind of companies I worked, I used to work as a consultant. If it was a big ones like SAP um, or startups, uh, somehow I was always involved and also interested in how does our software actually run in production because in the end you're still responsible I had to figure out uh, what went wrong. And a uh, large part of that was also virtualization. I mean, it's been a topic around. Um, and uh, from VMware via LXC via um, uh, um, Xen or whatever um, virtualization technology out there, probably have been seeing one around, um, around, the, uh, around Houston in production and always something didn't work. I was pissed off at it. So, um, I was interested in see, okay, how can you actually, you have a virtualization or deployment um, virtualization environment that actually helps developers uh, to figure something out. And with Docker and Kubernetes for the first time, I kind of found something that actually worked. And that's basically the story I want to tell. How did we, how did we go through there? Um, yeah, as a, to kick it off, so why did we start with it? Um, my first idea was, uh, because Copenia, our software is basically a SaaS software product that helps companies with analytics around customer service, a lot of machine learning, a lot of big data. And uh, we ran as a SaaS company, so we updated our software. And uh, we wanted to kind of um, go, we said, okay, we're SaaS, we have enterprise clients, but we're moving more towards SME companies. So we want to see how can we update our software more often. So we're looking into continuous deliver delivery um, and continuous deployment so that we can, in the end, uh, make sure our software is uh, released often and um, up to high quality. Um, I think most of you guys are very familiar with this, so basic idea is that whatever feature you develop, whatever you're doing, uh, you make sure that any kind of change to your software automatically gets built, um, which means, depending on how your setup is, you compile it, you run unit tests, and then you push it through different environments from um, their own environments in a, in a development environment just for this one feature, if you're using a branch flow in your environment, to development en environments, uh, UAT environments, and finally production. And uh, the basic idea behind the process and continuous delivery and deployment is that you automate all the steps along the way. So you don't have manual process or human intervention at these steps. Um, I think small thing, more semantic between uh, here's the wording, continuous delivery, conti uh, continuous uh, deployment. Uh, the steps not necessarily automatic, so if you have some kind of final improvement step between stages, if you say you want to do large deployments, then you may have something in between. But that just means kind of um, approval. In the end, you're still trying to automate the whole process so that anyone in the company or in the development team at least is able to run this and uh, get it done. So that was our main goal as well. Because we had, we have a complex system. We have a lot of um, big data things that we do. So the whole system was kind of always set up in a way that required us uh, to really like deployments and run things. Means configuration, means setting things up. Because it, it was always like some small um, changes in performance and that we had to consider. So for us, 
deployment in any existing bundle is very important to get there because we haven't been there, because we had virtual machines, uh, we had clusters of these things, but they all were managed manually. We used Puppet or Salt Stack for automation of these things, but we didn't really have automated all these steps. So we did automated builds, but from there on it was a manual process to compile something together, update an environment, deploy the software, do testing, and so on. So our goal was to really get this automated end to end to, um, to pick up our delivery speed. Uh, the second thing that we want to um, get done is we have seen when we're developing features, specifically user-facing features, um, it took quite a long turnaround to get feedback from business and from um, anyone in the company. Uh, we follow a standard big branching model, which basically means there's a master branch, which is our um, the main software, of the, of the main version of our software that we're releasing. Uh, we then create a feature or bug fix branches uh, for what we uh, what we have on each um, push. Uh, of course, a built in or a continuous um, integration environment is uh, triggered, so it runs unit tests and so on. At one point, a pull request is created, so other developers can review the code, um, comment on it, then it's merged into master, and then it was um, basically deployed um, and ready for, for testing in the dev environment. Uh, the one thing that we have seen is that there was a huge uh, gap typically between the code review and when it was ready then for UAT and feedback. Because uh, the pull request you couldn't really deploy to an environment, so you had to first make sure someone could test it locally, maybe you could, if you're lucky, someone has time, joins the developer, gives some feedback on the machine directly, but it was very hard to kind of deploy a branch into um, a proper environment. And this kind of this, uh, added up to a gap for us, it took up to one week wow. until kind of uh, from code review and there was some iterations on this kind of stuff to get it really done. So what we wanted to do, um, and that's also where this whole continuous delivery came in, is that each branch we actually wanted, while it was developed, to enable the business or anyone in the company to really give feedback on, um, on this kind of uh, feature as it gets developed. So what we want to set up is basically on each push, always an environment was ready uh, for this kind of feature for people to check out, to test, to give feedback, so we can incorporate it directly. So at the moment when this code review, basically the user acceptance test, so any kind of feedback is already done and incorporated. Therefore shortening this whole cycle and getting us ready to really deploy, um, to deploy much faster. The idea behind this and why we chose Docker was basically when we started, and this was in around April uh, last year, I think, um, it was back then the de facto standard for containers. Um, it had native support on most cloud platforms. Uh, we were running, we were still running on uh, Google Cloud, but if for some reason we had to switch, it would also be available in uh, Azure and Amazon Web Services and so on. So it was a standard that could run anywhere. You could run it locally, so if you needed some kind of service combination that you can have your developers checking out, you can just pull the container, run it, and uh, integrate it. And it was also a fancy word. Everyone was actually talking about Docker. Um, most people didn't really know what it was uh, back then, but everyone wanted to do something with it or try something with it. And for us, the same. So we as a CTO, I said, hey, Docker is cool. I want to try this. Let's do something. So I want to start with this uh, in the end and use it uh, for that. So a quick, maybe by show of hands, uh, who knows Docker? Otherwise, I'm going to walk through this much faster. Perfect. Uh, who knows Kubernetes? Did Okay, so some things I'm just going to skip over. Docker basically a way to separate your apps uh, in your application, not on the operating system level, but more on the library um, application code level. So you don't get a fully virtualized uh, system, but you're getting virtualized basically everything that your application needs to run, libraries, dependent services, um, and so on. Uh, then that's kind of as a, as a, what did we then do? So okay, to just start with it, we needed something to start with. So what we took was basically our front end application as a first idea uh, to actually um, get, it, uh, get it out. Uh, but uh, basically, the top three is our whole for typically front-end uh, project if you want to build it. So install your dependencies, run your uh, build script, it kind of generates a final static HTML for the output. Um, and uh, to get this into Docker, and yeah, you can't see it, but basically it's two lines, so saying basically pull in the Nginx image, copy the output of our build into it, Docker build and then Docker run and you have your whole uh, front-end application in a Docker container. So a Docker file with two lines of code, that's all it takes. So that's also where I started with and said, hey, this is cool, pretty simple, let's do it. Um, as we'll see, that is not uh, all it, but it's pretty easy to get started. And uh, I think everyone who worked with Docker has had the same experience. You get something that's quite nice uh, with uh, two lines of code that you can start, uh, start using. So um, after we figured out, okay, hey, this is how you build a Docker container, what we did next was in the end, okay, how can we set up Kupenia um, to use uh, Docker in the goals that we have? Okay, each branch is always deployed and always testable. 
Uh, for this, we took a look first, okay, what the basic idea behind this. And the basic idea was we said, okay, pretty simple for each branch, um, so if you have different repositories, whatever, for each branch, for each commit, uh, we're always building a Docker container in the end. We have a Docker file, pretty easy. You run it, integrate it into your uh, build infrastructure. <laughs> And it's running, it's a Docker image you put into a registry, so you can, act, um, you can always access it. And finally, um, <coughs> you um, set up the Docker containers and run them somewhere. Uh, so all things, the schematic also was ideal, but same thing. So you push, um, Jenkins or Continuous Integration takes care of building it, and instead of generating your zip file, or WAR file, JAR file with your application, it puts this Docker container somewhere, and then uh, we deploy this for each branch and each build automatically to an, uh, to an environment. What we looked at, and we had uh, one of our um, actually started uh, because it was, uh, was a nice to have because it's a lot of effort to get the thing figured out, set up. Specifically, it's DevOps task, so it means testing this whole flow. It can easily take 20 minutes, half an hour to like test small changes. We had actually interns starting on this because for us it was not a, a small startup back then, it's still a startup, big bigger now. But when we started, uh, we didn't really have the resources to say, okay, we have a dedicated person doing this uh, for a while to set it up. So we had an intern starting, he did some research, checking in with us. And uh, what, we, um, what we decided is, okay, what is the actual problem? What we quickly figured out is the problem is actually the somewhere. So you have your Docker container, what do you do with it? Uh, you can always do a Docker run, blah, 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 but uh, a lot of questions were answers like, how do we update uh, the <coughs> Docker container, for example? How do we connect it to the database? How do we, um, set a con how do we tell it, um, ah, if you have, let's say, per branch, you have two environments running, how do we tell it this is environment A, this is environment B, how are they connected, how do you give it a public IP address to access it. Like all these questions uh, came up. So it's pretty, um, uh, pretty okay. You need some kind of uh, solution for, uh, for this. Uh, we looked at different things. Uh, back then it was, uh, I'm gonna get this right, it was uh, Docker, or what was it? Docker Compose, right? Yeah, Docker Compose, Mesos, I think, and uh, Kubernetes were kind of the things that uh, we looked at back then. And uh, what made the run in the end was Kubernetes uh, that, we, that we went for and decided for. The main reason because it, uh, like the whole concepts around Kubernetes really said, hey, this makes sense, which was something we didn't really see in the other, um, in the other um, platforms. Plus, uh, it was, again, we're running on Google. It was uh, not officially Google, but most of it is actually made by, uh, by Google, or the people behind it is Google. It has native support in the Google environment, so that's why we ended up doing it. Um, Again, Kubernetes was how it worked, was the name for most, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically Kubernetes uh, on a high level is an environment that specifies how do you actually run your Docker container. Um, there's a few concepts you have to know. Uh, at the top level you have Kubernetes master, which is responsible to manage a set of uh, nodes. Um, each node is just a, a machine somewhere that has some Kubernetes services running and is able to schedule something which is called a pod. And a pod um, inside Kubernetes is actually a set of containers. So you can say, oh, I need uh, my application, I need a database, or if I have two services running, you can say those two are deployed together, it's the most atomic unit that you can have, and run these Docker containers somewhere. What it puts on top is, it uh, solves the problem of how do these services communicate, and how are they layout on network layer, because you have basically a proxy or an alias that you can define. Um, all traffic going through um, this endpoint goes to the following uh, Docker containers that are running somewhere and just give them a, an alias, a label, or some other criteria, so you can easily specify one endpoint, and uh, Kubernetes takes care of routing the traffic to the right uh, Docker containers. And uh, this scales across the nodes, so it's transparent for you in the end where the um, Docker containers, or these units, the pods are running, how they're communicating with, an, with, with each other, all the stuff around DNS, networking, and so on, is taken, taken away from you. And I'm gonna get into more details later when talk about how to put this into production. Um, um, then, yeah, that basically, um, I, uh, this basically goes to, okay, what does it mean? So we used Kubernetes and we had our continuous um, delivery pipeline update to basically always, whenever a branch is created, uh, checks, oh, it's already uh, a deployment running for this. It was, um, uh, it was uh, downloading the code. If not, it was setting up the environment. And uh, yeah, then as soon as there was a push on the branch, an update, it just uh, deleted basically the whole uh, deployed uh, uh, pods and uh, started restoring them in the next uh, version. Uh, it was pretty simple back then. We only used, again, something I want to cover more later when talking about production, we used, we literally had scripts that just managed the pods, deployed them, turned them down, started them up. So we didn't use any of the nice features around uh, Kubernetes um, that I'm going to tell about more when we said, okay, how does it look when you brought it out into production? 
You just use it as something to say, hey, put a, do put a Docker um, container somewhere, give it an IP address, and we did the wiring and the rest um, on, on our side. What uh, we did on top was a simple tool because we still need something to manage it. So what's also back intern, you wrote basically a simple tool that uh, was used where you could just select a branch, you could select uh, what kind of database you was using. So we're doing uh, full backups of, of all our databases. Um, so while you could select um, from which day you want to have something, click on a button and it created an, a whole environment uh, and deployed it to Docker where you had a fresh copy of if you wanted production data, it set up um, as well. Um, uh, containers and everything that had uh, Elasticsearch running, which is uh, one of our main databases, MongoDB and so on, and uh, you could have an, actually like a whole copy of a production environment for a specific branch running within five minutes, um, and everything was running on, uh, top of, uh, on top of Kubernetes and Docker. And yeah, you clicked another button, it was gone again. So it made it very scalable and really made it possible for us to have these kind of really separate environments where you could easily test and figure out, uh, and even enable business users to do like full tests on real data, um, on the whole feature, instead of just having one environment where you manage all these uh, kind of things. <coughs> yeah, that as a, as a quick summary so far where we started out with. So, to summarize, it was really just the first idea, how can you try this, how can we use it? To give you a perspective from the time frame, so from this first idea in, I think it was April, uh, May last year, uh, to, hey, let's get started, doing some, some tests on the side, to actually then having uh, someone working around three months uh, um, full time on getting this into a uh, deploy. I think it was around September last year when we were running just uh, to get this kind of uh, small things, um, small thing running on the on the site. It took a lot of effort as well because we have multiple services um, setting up this whole pipeline. So it was a lot of uh, a lot of work that actually went into just getting the basics running and figuring out how to run these things on top of uh, Kubernetes. <coughs> um, then what the next step uh, for us was after we started, it came from another, um, another part of the company, said, hey, this is cool. Um, we've seen already some advantages of uh, this. We actually, because we had one big node that shared all these environments, we didn't actually scale it or do something with it. Just that one uh, machine running that uh, was running the Kubernetes um, environment. Um, couldn't we use this for build infrastructure? Because we have, we have multiple services, so we had stuff that was running in Python, we had stuff running in Scala, most of it. We had some things running in uh, some Java code, Nginx, and some other services. We said, actually, our build infrastructure is also quite uh, different because we're running integration tests and everything on top of uh, Jenkins, back then on fully virtualized machines. Um, and it was quite of, uh, really um, a mess to actually maintain all these different um, environments. Uh, so we said, hey, what we've learned from Docker is actually maintaining these environments with all the tools that you need uh, is quite easy. So can't we actually use our um, Docker and uh, also Kubernetes Kind of virtualize, not virtualize, but to containerize our um, our um, build infrastructure, because we had quite a lot of services in fact, then we had around 20 or 30 different builds that were running, depending on uh, what was done, and uh, because it was everything combined, basically our nodes that did the building always needed to have all tools installed, meaning front end code, Python code, Scala code. So all the stuff was always combined, so it was one big mess to actually maintain kind of like dedicated building nodes that were able to run certain uh, certain jobs. So we also looked into, um, uh, into Jenkins, and uh, Jenkins, for those who don't know it, it's a continuous integration service, which is basically master-slave driven. And you can just spawn up any node, it connects to the master, and then it can run a job to build something and say, oh, compile, test, and so on, what you need. Um, we created, we created basically then, for each service, or for each type of service, a specific set of build environments. And uh, again, sorry, the screenshots kind of don't make it to the projector. Uh, like here it's for our front-end build. Uh, we needed like um, uh, Node.js, we needed Gulp, we needed Bower, all these tools, um, which typically were all installed on our main build machines. We can now just put um, into one Docker container. So this doesn't have to worry about having Java there and so on. I think you know the advantages. So we actually have now highly, special, um, highly specialized build images that only provide the environment to build one specific type of services and not these big massive environments where we're installing all the tools and then uh, they all have to be there. Uh, you can't maintain different versions. Um, if you guys are interested, I'm not sure if anyone um, has started uh, virtualizing the build environments. Um, we have our Docker images there. There's some good tutorials how to do it with Jenkins. Uh, give it a try. For us, it really uh, saved a lot of work and made our whole build infrastructure, especially in this complex environment, uh, much easier. Uh, some simple benefits that we actually got through this, and we didn't plan this, but when we picked back then Kubernetes, um, some things we kind of got for free um, from Kubernetes was on the one hand, 
because Kubernetes again thinks of pods, so it doesn't deploy a single um, Docker container, but actually you can specify a set of Docker container, containers that are always connected. Um, it was pretty easy for us to say, um, okay, I have this one Docker container, it's my build environment, uh, Gulp, Bower, or I don't know, some JDK, and so on, what you need. But next to it, I have a MongoDB, I run my unit tests on top, I have an Elasticsearch, I need my um, things on top. So here you just say, okay, actually, um, you, we have a pluggable infrastructure to kind of deploy our, um, um, our things on top of Docker. So instead of now having, we had back then again, we had our build machines, and we had some Mongo database running, an Elasticsearch cluster running, um, I think even a Redis or whatever you needed. So, um, but it was, first of all, it was shared between all the builds. So if something tested or didn't go wrong, it didn't really work out. And here, and literally, it took like 10 minutes to actually set up, uh, to try just adding another um, pot on top of it. Um, it's a Jenkins plugin that does all the stuff. We could easily run our whole uh, build infrastructure, which is each, again, each build actually having its separate database that gets set up and turned down, and there's no need to kind of manage any complex uh, infrastructure. And this is very pluggable, so when you want to try, I don't know, the next version of MongoDB or something, you just flip one config switch and you immediately can run it against the whole thing without any kind of effort or, uh, or work, uh, code spent on setting something up. Um, another thing we got for free, uh, I'm going to get to back to that later as well, we are running on top of uh, Google Container Engine, uh, which we use to run our, um, uh, our uh, machines. It has a way to auto-scale your Kubernetes nodes. And especially in our built environment, we had the issue that we, uh, because we're running quite a lot of integration tests, um, which are quite heavy, so a full build can easily take 20 minutes to run a lot of tests because it needs full data, it needs things to test like machine learning algorithms and so on. So uh, we had always like a very high capacity that we had to have in standby when someone uh, built it. And yeah, we shut it down overnight, scaled it down, but in the end it was still kind of uh, hard to see because there was sometimes more activity, sometimes less activity on the stuff. So we could easily go from needing two or three cores for the whole day when there's not much uh, going on in central services to needing easily 20, 30, 40 cores to run builds when there's a lot of activity on certain things. And uh, this kind of scale um, with also Kubernetes, we could easily set up auto-scaling uh, just, to, uh, just to say, oh, when the usage, usage goes to a certain amount, add another node. So all our build containers were scheduled um, next to it. So we had kind of, uh, for, we got a, a very good utilization and we scaled our build infrastructure. We always had like four nodes with eight cores running. Uh, we cut costs around to one third of this uh, just by having a dynamic um, workload on our um, infrastructure. Uh, in the end, that was something also just realized after that. You can actually use this click click. So we could have set it up, and uh, just by choosing Kubernetes, we actually got this kind of set up uh, set up for free. Um, yeah, this just as a thing. This was also was kind of next steps. It also took us like a month uh, to set up. It was a bit faster because we learned a lot around Kubernetes already. We could reuse a lot of knowledge that we had. Um, but uh, then around uh, October last year, November, we were at the stage where we said, okay, now we have every uh, basically dockerized everything until really uh, development environment, uh, testing environments, or build infrastructure, so what's the next step? Uh, this went hand in hand with also flips that we did um, to complete microservices um, setup to see, okay, uh, can we use Kubernetes in production? Can we use all these advantages which we've gained here and really um, set our main product uh, on top of this? Uh, for this quick background on how our architecture uh, looks like. Um, and uh, basically uh, what we have is, um, for example, we have around uh, three components. We're receiving real-time data from external sources. Um, so customers are sending us, uh, sending us the data. This can be different data depending on the company that we use for analytics. Uh, we have an engine that has different modules, uh, basically an analytics pipeline, as a process events, runs machine learning, um, does aggregations, provides stuff for reporting puts it into different databases, maybe let's search MongoDB, um, and yeah, provides in the results to the front end, which is a different set of services that kind of does all stuff, security, authentication, uh, storing user information, making it available. Uh, it, was, it was around four or five different services that you have seen here. Internally, this was already kind of like a microservice setup, so it was, even if it was one build, one tool, we already had service boundaries in between uh, on the application level but it wasn't really deployed across a network, a network stack. So we only managed like three, four services that we were deploying into production. Uh, but it had different issues like update times and so on, so it was uh, hard, to hard to do. So afterwards, we actually split our whole infrastructure into microservices <coughs> architecture, uh, starting out with, uh, with our six, seven services, now having grown to easily 15, 16, going to 20, um, which really uh, kind of um, made much, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into microservices uh, talk here, just saying we had kind of afterwards 20 different services that we had set up to also deploy um, 
and maintain. And that uh, we said, okay, this is actually not possible <coughs> to really, it's possible, but we said um, it's very hard to now manage this kind of thing with our current setup. We're still using salt stack to deploy into production of virtual machines, but it's really not feasible anymore to manage this kind of uh, scale easily in a thing. So we looked, okay, Kubernetes could actually be an answer um, to solve this kind of problem how to manage um, a la large number of microservices in, in a production environment. And so we sat down and said, okay, what kind of problems do you typically encounter when you want to deploy uh, your application? And uh, most important is, of course, okay, how do you manage versions? How do you deploy and schedule and update uh, services? So how do you kind of get your Docker container into a um, production environment? Another one is how do you scale it? So because we have sometimes, okay, you have more load, um, data size increases, whatever, so you need to, uh, Recalculating certain things, so you need to increase uh, increase the um, the services that you have. You have to monitor them uh, to make sure they're running, they they are healthy, um, and you have to um, take care of logging uh, on the services as well. Uh, that was kind of some higher topics. There's a lot of other things that we came across while doing this, um, but that was kind of our initial um, setup and uh, kind of thoughts and stuff that we thought, okay, this uh, is what we need to uh, need to tackle. Um, and then, how does this work with uh, Kubernetes? Um, just a quick recap, as maybe most of you know as well. Uh, so basically, um, Kubernetes, uh, to manage these kind of things, Kubernetes has certain uh, mechanisms. Uh, we have, uh, when I share the slides, I copy paste when I share the slides, uh, put it in the source, because other interesting talks actually that they explain this much better than me. Uh, Kubernetes, um, to like, manage your things across different uh, nodes, so different machines, uh, it puts something called the front or image pause replication controller. Uh, which is kind of like an abstraction of a, of a port where you can say, again, a port has multiple uh, Docker containers. Uh, you just say, oh, I want to have this port and I want to have it running one time, two times, three times, five times. So you can actually specify how many of these um, ports do you want to have running in your environment. And uh, the replication controller takes care of uh, that it's um, the required number of um, uh, ports are there. And uh, if something crashes, it restarts it. Uh, if something, for example, let's say this whole node, um, this whole node gets down, it makes sure that those ports are rescheduled across the other ones, um, and all this kind of thing. So it's basically a manager that makes sure that your Docker containers are, are running at a specified amount, amount of numbers, that they're restarted, and so, so on. Uh, as the other features, um, because this just uh, specifies basically how do you actually deploy it. So how do I get Docker container into production? How can I make sure it's running and uh, I can delete it again? Um, and so on. It doesn't solve the problem, how do you actually um, manage this? Um, and that's where, uh, uh, that's where um, Kubernetes has certain uh, functionality again, and uh, it abstracts two things away. It has something called a service, and it has something called a deployment. Um, in Kubernetes, uh, service is kind of like an abstraction to access uh, different ports. So when we have, uh, uh, when we have running here um, different ports on different nodes, uh, necessarily when someone externally or even another port wants to access a service, it doesn't know where to go, it has to find it somewhere. Kubernetes introduces this concept of a service, which basically answers the question, um, if I get a request, um, the request can be anything, TCP level, um, so REST and so on, uh, Mongo da databases can be whatever you, uh, you have in mind. It basically says, okay, I have an account request, where do we have to go? Um, it specifies uh, kind of labels, it's a way to, to filter and select certain ports. So each of your pods typically has a lot of metadata. You give it a name, what type of service it is. You give it a version number. Uh, you may give it even um, certain other labels if you want to manage security. But you can identify um, this specifically. And the service, you tell, OK, I want to route this. Um, any request I'm getting or any connection I'm getting, I want to route to one of these uh, pods that, we, um, uh, that fits this description. And this way, you can easily man transparently manage your traffic. And you don't have to care about where it is deployed, which one of my pods gets it, as long as it is uh, fitting within this um, description. And this way you manage basically the routing uh, of the traffic. Uh, another thing it um, takes care of, and that's what Kubernetes introduces on top of this, while, as we had before, a replication controller, a single one, only takes basically care of managing this um, in combination, so the service would be in front of the replication, uh, would be separate from the replication controller, but they're working hand in hand. Um, the replication controller manages uh, your Docker containers and ports to make sure they are properly available and the service sits on top to take care of this uh, routing. What is missing now, how do you do um, basically updates uh, around this service? So you have deployed a uh, version of your software uh, in version 1.0. Now you want to upgrade this to the next version, version 2.0. Uh, 
obvious um, solution is, and that's how you, it works previously with um, replication controllers. You just create a new version of this um, a service, so you create a replication controller. Uh, that's okay, here's my service, the next version, 2.0. And it starts scaling up uh, different ports. So, if you take this as an example, this is version 1, version 2, you're just adding this one, and now you're running both in parallel. Uh, then, typical flow would be uh, you need to redirect now the traffic to the second one, afterwards, you can delete this one. Um, and then, it's kind of quite a, complex, uh, quite a complex procedure if you do this manually. And that's why Kubernetes um, has this concept of a deployment, which kind of orchestrates um, this whole thing. So you can easily tell it to, okay, um, I want to replace, basically, and that's where the deployment, this is a management on top of all of this, it says I want to upgrade from version, two, uh, from version 1 to version 2. You just give it the new um, specification of the version, which is typically a different, differently tagged Docker container, uh, but can also be new settings, or whatever you want to put into your, um, into your specification. And you can also tell it, okay, I want to do upgrades by, let's say you have two, I want to have, have at least one uh, pod available. And then step by step, um, the deployment manager in Kubernetes basically takes care of uh, adding a new version of support, tearing down old versions. And also the same with the traffic, so it makes sure it manages all these kind of things across so you can actually do a zero downtime or rolling update of your whole um, do, uh, deployed Docker, uh, Docker container and application without having any issues to take care about uh, how do I route my traffic, um, how do I uh, delete the old version, and so on. Uh, also has integrated uh, mechanisms for rollback, so if you say, oh, I updated it, something doesn't work, it can, uh, it can transparently roll back uh, your version as well. Thus, with a very simple, um, uh, it's a very simple um, uh, tool, because behind this is a, it's a config file, which is uh, yeah. idiot safe in the end. Uh, with a very simple mechanism, you can easily manage complex um, deployment scenarios uh, where you don't have to take care of much. You don't have to take care of, um, is okay, what happens to my new code, my old code, what happens in case of an error, and so on. It's all very well defined and all managed by uh, Kubernetes for you. <coughs> yeah, so that's quick. Does this uh, every question so far, or is that because uh, it's kind of now gets more complicated? Uh, yes, please. I have like 10 questions, so maybe someone... Okay, anything more? <laughs> uh, maybe quickly, just uh, from a concept perspective uh, around the deployments and how these kind of things are managed. Does this make sense to everyone? <laughs> if it's a more general question, we may better move it to the end. Okay, because we're going to have two more topics that's kind of built on top of this that are interesting. So, um, typically you need, uh, and that's again where Kubernetes really comes in because it has a defined standard. You could like it or not like it, that's your, uh, your choice. But to kind of manage, okay, how do I know if my um, kind of uh, Docker container is ready to take traffic? Um, how do I see if my Docker container is actually there um, and ready uh, and still able to receive traffic because it didn't crash or ran out of memory or something? Um, what uh, uh, Kubernetes defines is um, two things, basically they're health checks, but they're categorized into two types. Um, it's a liveliness probe and a readiness probe. Um, I'm going to start with the readiness probe. Ready, uh, readiness probe is basically at defining, okay, my container is ready, my pods so are using it a bit interchangeable, but the container in the context of Kubernetes for me is now a kind of like pod. So my pod is ready to um, receive traffic, which is, uh, you can define anything, it can be a Typically, it's a REST endpoint so that you're just calling to tell it, uh, yeah, I'm ready to receive um, traffic, but you can also define a shell script uh, if you want, uh, or just monitor it as a keyboard to see if uh, the service is available. Um, and it basically says, okay, the moment um, my service returns okay, I can start sending traffic to it. So it means all my initializations are done, your port is bound, of course, because otherwise you couldn't, uh, couldn't connect to it. Um, and uh, also that uh, your, um, all your startup um, kind of things are done. So, just by implementing the simple REST endpoint, which most of your services probably have as a, as a, a live thing anyway, you can just use in this way, um, just by reusing your existing uh, endpoint, uh, you're getting kind of for free to know that you're not, uh, that Kubernetes only stops the old port when it knows that the new one is there. So you actually have always, uh, always something available, Well, otherwise it would be pretty hard to know, okay, can I already start sending requests to it or not? Um, the same kind of concept, but it's the uh, same, you can also have a liveliness probe because uh, it pings, uh, it's configurable of course, it can ping every X seconds, minutes, um, if the port is still available and is it still healthy. So for example, um, if it doesn't reply at all or if your database is, database is not available, it's up to you, but you can specify REST endpoints that it gets checked regularly and if something doesn't respond as it should anymore, um, Kubernetes automatically takes care of killing it and also restarting it and rescheduling it. Uh, that mainly gets to um, things if you have, uh, for example, uh, one of your whole, we had it a few times, because um, uh, Kubernetes is not so well, uh, actually, especially in the area of memory, uh, sorry, not Kubernetes, Docker, especially in memory, um, 
memory hungry processes can still take down your whole node uh, because it's not proper virtualization. Uh, we had a lot of times that one of our Docker containers that used more memory than it should tore down the whole host operating system um, as well. And then suddenly a single port can actually take down a whole node, taking out another few, um, uh, few of your ports. And then because the Lightning probe response uh, stops responding, um, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, because in that moment, Kubernetes just picks it up and restarts it somewhere else. So you always have this kind of thing running. So it's, it's a very easy mechanism to kind of keep your whole environment um, available. Even the guard is kind of, because you have a shared environment, that's one of the problems. So even if one thing is going haywire, uh, taking down whole nodes, uh, it easily um, uh, starts it again. And since we uh, started running on this, uh, we actually had um, a lot of alerts that we used to get around, ah, things are down, needs to be restarted. We don't have this uh, issue at all. Um, Anymore, so we have no no one actually has restarted or worried about keeping the system alive. Which proves, yeah, we check log files, blah blah. Since we kind of these kind of simple mechanisms with Kubernetes, it's one big worry that we're not uh, taking care of anymore uh, in in our operational side of, uh, of things. Yeah. Is there something to support like connection draining when you're killing containers, or you want to shut down containers? You only do so if all connections are. Uh, so when you're, that's more around the life cycle of, uh, um, of deployment. So when it starts um, like taking up a new one, killing off another one, it doesn't literally kill it. It sends a, uh, I think it's, a, it's on, on operating system to its uh, term. Uh, and then your service has time to shut it down. And uh, you can specify timeouts and so on that are happening. So we do the same because we also have some services that require a clean shutdown because we have a, it's, a, it's a stateful environment. So when it gets a signal, we have sometimes up to one or two minutes where it actually takes down to properly shut down a, a stateful, uh, stateful service. During this time, you can drain connections. In our case, we're writing state um, somewhere. And only when it's completely down, it will take off um, a rotation. And then, uh, uh, so you can all configure this kind of, kind of things. Uh -huh. um, then, uh, so that's kind of the start of things, how to deploy things. Another part is how do you manage log files? So yeah, you have a big environment, you have lots of different services, you have a lot of pods. Um, how do you, um, how, what do you do with it? And again, that's something where Kubernetes has an answer. Um, I don't know the exact thing about Spectre, but I think it specifies an abstract logging uh, framework where you can have, uh, okay, the output of certain, uh, of the console by default is logged, but you can also monitor log files within a, uh, within a container. Um, and then it uh, takes all this outlook and puts it somewhere. Um, we're using Google Container Engine, uh, they have their own logging. Uh, but it's internally using Fluentd, which is a log, uh, log aggregator service. And you can easily remove the service, replace it with your own thing, log stash and so on, send it to Elasticsearch. But the important thing is it really it has a well-defined concept how um, logging output is gathered, how it is um, connected, and what is done with it on a, on a cluster level. And uh, you can easily then do whatever you, uh, you want to actually put it somewhere um, and, uh, and use it. And that was one thing we spent five minutes on it at the end. So we uh, just said, hey, this works, we will find. So didn't have any problems uh, around logging uh, to get the logs. We have different problems what you do with the logs, but at least gathering the log and making them available, um, that was something we didn't have any kind of thing that we need to, uh, to look at and how to do it. Um, yeah, I was wondering the other part, and it goes more around how do you integrate this now into your, I'm oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, well, if you have a few containers in the pod, all work in the same time, so you synchronize all the work. Sorry? If you have a few containers in the same service, you yeah. synchronize the logging of the Do you mean that uh, to make sure that stuff like timestamp is there or that you can track? I think because in the end, yeah, what the. Uh, you're going to request coming from the different containers and just basically the same application. What happens with the logs? How are they put together? Uh, each um, each port and each container has its own kind of uh, log ID. So I just know how it works in Google. We have all this kind of metadata, which gives us a container name, the port name, and so on. And they have kind of like, a, basically, it's a, it's a flag that says so, because it's a JSON structure that at least derives here, which has all this kind of stuff by, by service, uh, also within the containers. I'm not sure other logging and implementations. Sorry, by timestamp. Maybe that's what it means. Yeah, I'm sure. It basically, it's a tail, so it, it puts it uh, puts it in. But if if you uh, you have no guarantee that uh, logs from A with B are at the same time gathered or aggregated, that's up to up to you in the end. So I'm not sure if I does it answer it. Or? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Ah, yeah. Uh, we'll get back to that. Yeah. You mentioned Fluentd, right? 
Yeah. Do you use fluent is there a fluent demon in the running inside of every bot? Uh, not as way. I don't can say how Google sets it up. I actually have no idea how this works in the default Kubernetes setup. But basically, they have one fluent D running for each node, and that's a service that is available and that takes care of uh, tailing the log files. So you don't put like fluent D inside your container or something. No, it's not inside your containers. It's okay. possible. You can do. A, I've seen people manually doing this kind of setups, but at least for us, it's the default setup on the Google Container Engine, how they implement it. And actually, no, it's, it's a standard setup on every. Kubernetes yeah, standard setup, but Kubernetes has a something called a daemon set, and it runs yeah. a container on every single node. So that's that's what you use for monitoring and log aggregation. That's how they do. Two and is not standard setup. That's how they run it on every So maybe they run it as a process in the OS. And but is it possible to send the logs like to Bakery or something? Whatever you want. So basically, you have mentioned with the daemon set, so you can say, okay, run this one service, and then you can send your log things. And this could be we also tried it with the log stash and Kibana. But you can run whatever you want on top of uh, this in the end. Um, just this is all box configured. In some, you may have to set up your own logging configuration to actually get it get it sensor. And because uh, what I've been doing is I put it like a like a RCS log D even inside of every container, but I, it's not really good practice. I think it's better to do it on cluster level. Yeah. Well, the daemon set is the standard practice. Yeah, but then you don't lose efficiency. You run it on and Kubernetes takes care of running it, but you don't lose efficiency. For us, we have a lot of more information per log entry, so we're actually using some JSON format uh, that we're outputting and that is then aggregated on top. Um, just because of the time wise we're running out, I'm just going to go through this. Um, how do you make sure that your things are properly deployed? So it's more like what we're doing, it's nothing to do with Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes again just helps. Uh, we set up proper deployment pipelines. So um, each commit actually gets pushed and individually um, deployed towards your um, uh, your environment. Uh, what I do is important for Kubernetes is again this whole setup, like saying, hey, here's my new Docker container, manage it. Is this much code? Um, this that's all that's needed from our side to actually uh, to actually get um, any kind of service integrated in a proper continuous delivery um, pipeline. And the same goes for environments. We have a set of scripts uh, it's integrated even in the Jenkins UI where you just say, hey, uh, this branch, put it there. Um, this version, put it there, um, and it generates like throwing all our services into one, um, uh, into a new uh, namespace or something in, uh, in Kubernetes is again this much code. It's really easy because you just have your standards, of course, it generates your um, descriptors for Kubernetes, and you say, hey, this is my server, so with different environments, and it really goes there. So it really made this kind of setup, took us in the end uh, not much time uh, to actually get, uh, get done. Um, I mentioned already a few times uh, what all these kind of things. Uh, we, I think we tried it once, but we stopped after an hour. <laughs> like setting up a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes thing you're on, and uh, why am I using Google Container Engine? Uh, I'm in general a Google fanboy, but that's a different thing. Uh, but you also get this on Amazon, I think you get this on Azure. So I think by more, most cloud providers um, have some kind of uh, Kubernetes uh, turnkey solution by now. Um, it basically makes sure you have ready to use nodes, so you have an environment that's clearly specified, starting up a Kubernetes thing. Um, it provides you also um, a container registry where you can upload your, um, your code because you don't necessarily want to put it somewhere, somewhere public or <coughs> even it. Um, it supports upgrade of Kubernetes, so if you want to go from 1.42 to 1.43, it's one click, it does a round robin upgrade on all the nodes, makes sure always one is at least available. Um, and um, you can even have, um, you can have all scaling, so adding nodes depending on certain metrics, it's all possible. And like category logging and monitoring uh, is also taken, uh, taken care of. Um, yeah, it's, um, I'm going to skip the last part because of the time things, but just some, this was just a quick introduction of what we did with Kubernetes on um, uh, Docker to actually get it in. It was already quite a lot of effort. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that's the end of it, because now you have all your services running, we discussed already logging, you have your log somewhere. How do you actually now get log files across different ports and services? Uh, how do you gather metrics and stuff across different, uh, different services? Um, because typically with Kubernetes, one of the reasons you use this because you have a distributed landscape, so microservices architecture, means lots of services calling other services, uh, which then introduce a problem of how do you keep track of this, how do you trace calls, how do you monitor this, um, this stuff, how do you keep track of this, um, but that's a topic for a whole other talk uh, um, in, in the end, that you really have kind of like this, uh, keep track of these kind of uh, service calls inside your architecture. If you're interested, if you check, there was a while ago the React meetup, uh, there's a slides from how we're doing this on top of Kubernetes in our, uh, in our um, architecture. Same here. How do you keep traces? How do you see with different services and ports? How long they're taking? 
This is all stuff that Kubernetes doesn't have an answer for, but it's problems you typically have when you start building stuff on top of a, an architecture like Kubernetes. So you, you have to keep in mind, same with monitoring, logging I mentioned already. It's, uh, it's really a lot of things that are coming after you actually have been running it in the, the production. How do we take the next steps? And for this, you're also not going to get an answer necessarily uh, from Kubernetes. But I think we're hearing something about also in the, uh, in the second talk. Um, as a quick summary, so what kind of our key takeaways, so our whole journey with Docker took us probably the better part of a year uh, by now. Um, what we generally figured out, like really starting with Docker is that simple. You have your Docker file, you have a few commands in it, and you have your first application in a Docker container. Um, but rolling it really out into production is quite a lot of things. So uh, from the beginning to the end, I think from us to like really getting Docker containers into production, building the Docker container is only the first five, ten percent. The rest comes after it, and that for us at least, we also didn't really have the, the eye for, and that's also why it took us quite a long while to actually um, uh, get there. Another thing is, if you really want to do it, just uh, do it right, and don't just do it on the side. What I mentioned, we started experimenting a bit, we dropped it again, and then we had a half solution. Um, really, for us, getting into production uh, meant also proper engineering, people involved, so you really have to invest uh, time, money, and resources to get it done, because it's a lot of testing, and you want to have this thing stable. And to figure all these things out, it, it just takes time. So um, it's not something you can just do like, like this. At least if you have a bit more than your one or two applications you want to run um, in a proper um, environment. Uh, Docker, I mentioned at the beginning, Docker only solves one problem. It really uh, takes care of how do I take my code and put it in an environment that has the right dependencies. It doesn't answer any questions around how do I deploy this, how do I monitor it, how do I log it, how do I update my, my thing. So when you, people talk about Docker or saying, hey, we're doing Docker, um, that's why we started as well when I said Docker is cool, everyone wants to do it. I've seen everyone talking, yeah, I do Docker. I have very few people actually seen, today it changes a bit because tools are further, like actually running Docker in a, in a production environment um, in the end. Uh, on the other end, Kubernetes uh, has an answer to most of these uh, questions. I covered some of the topics that we, uh, we had, um, and from our, at least from our side, Kubernetes really makes Docker and microservice and all these kind of things usable. It answers all your questions, it has your opinions, so certain things you can either live with or don't live with, uh, live with, but at least it's customizable to a degree that when you say, oh, I don't like how it does logging, I don't like how it does, um, does this and this, you can easily uh, replace it with your own, uh, uh, with your own um, services on top. But the core problems, how do you do updates? How do you expose a service? How do I uh, make sure services are communicating? How do I make sure stuff is running? All these kind of things it solves for you uh, if, you, if, you, um, if, you're able, if you're able to kind of live with how it, uh, uh, how it tackles the concept. And the last thing is um, really uh, for us was important uh, because Kubernetes set up um, really find something that's ready to use because doing it by yourself, even if you run it or after tutorial, you typically don't necessarily have um, IP addresses. How do I expose my service to the internet? Public IP allo address allocation, like all these kind of things that are coming on top um, that really make it really scalable, really automatable, you haven't thought about and it will take you a lot of time to set up. So find something or someone who can really do this for you because otherwise you're spending more time setting up the stuff that's supposed to save you time than actually uh, actually doing it. So I talked to a lot of people who really run their own Kubernetes cluster for different reasons and the amount of money, knowledge and brain power and also external help that getting is quite large. So either make sure you have someone who does this for you or find some service that actually has it ready. Yeah, I think that was, uh, that was it. Um, so uh, thanks for your, for your time and attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can take a few now. I'm not sure time-wise, otherwise I'm around for the rest of the evening as well. <laughs> Bart, Do you update your uh, local host, the, the, the Docker host, the Kubernetes host? Uh, yeah, again, we're using Google Computer. Uh, um, uh, you mean the actual host operating system, or you mean yes. the, the Kubernetes version? No, the host operating system. The host operating system. So we're using Google Container Engine. Um, they have this kind of minimum image that they maintain, that Google maintains for, uh, for you, uh, which contains the uh, Kubernetes uh, services. And it's basically a very stripped down operating system that has nothing except all the Docker services ready. And uh, they keep care of maintaining and updating this for you. It's typically when they're saying, oh, we have Kubernetes 1.46, whatever. Um, they have one host operating system that's really, it's, it's a very hardened Linux. Uh, they have this called GCI, Google Container Image. It's really stripped down to the essentials, very hard and very secure thing, and that's what they release then. And uh, also update for you if you, um, if you want to, uh, to have the next, next version. And they bring it down and bring it up again? Uh, that too, that you have to control your, uh, you can configure it, you can either manually um, upgrade, or you can have an auto-upgrade and um, enable so they uh, manage this. Uh, Thank you.
Ruiz, thank you, Omar. Or, yeah, okay, let's take one more. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I have yeah. some questions about the build environment. Um, so you use Jenkins, right? Yeah. Um, like, how, okay, so you, do you ma manage a separate cluster for your build environment, separate container uh, cluster? Um, uh, yes, for the build environment, it also includes some stuff for our um, dev thing. So we're working typically with node pools, uh, which is a concept of um, cool container engines or Kubernetes in there, which means you each node has a certain label and you can say, okay, run this in my dev environment, production, customer A, and so on. Yeah, so I also use uh, Google container engines. So <coughs> that's why, uh, yeah, so you maintain a separate node pool, yeah. but the same cluster. Same cluster, yeah. Same cluster. Yeah. Like same cluster as production? Uh, as well, uh, so there, that's separated. So um, we actually, have to, no, it's really detailed because we also have different clients, enterprise clients with their own environment for security reasons and privacy reasons. So there we are uh, having them the own cluster, but the rest is kind of our whole dev thing is one shared environment, and then we have our production environment next to it. But so built in. Separate and Jenkins for production? Not, not Jenkins, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Okay, but your Jenkins cluster runs where? Because it runs on Kubernetes in the dev environment. In the dev environment. Yeah. But you use the same one for production, right? The same mm -hmm. Jenkins. Yes. How, do you, yes. how do you push your, how do you push like your... Uh, ah, you mean the management, yes. So the development Jenkins is also used to push and update the pipelines of the production. Yeah. 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 And how do you manage cleanup? Like for example, uh, PRs merged, right? Um, then how do you manage cleanup of the... the so it's integrated into our um, into our built environment, so we have kind of like scripts and stuff set up that oh, this is there, turn it down and so on. So it's kind of uh, um, all web, uh, Git hooked and so on, depending on the environment that we have. Thank you, Omar.